Hello there, welcome to Showcase. Greece looked back on America's youth culture of the 1950s from the lens of the 1970s. Now, more than 40 years later, it's getting a prequel. And besides claiming the blockbuster musical's legacy, the new series also tackles important issues that have troubled society since the 20th century. Good morning, boys and girls. And welcome to the 1954 to 55 school year. Livia. Paramount Plus's Greece prequel is set a few years before the events of the movie. And it looks at four outcast students who will go on to form the Pink Ladies clique. Critics say with its setting and musical numbers, the series captures the spirit of the original. But they add that the storyline, which presents the school as a birthplace of radical ideas surrounding gender equality and race, also lends it a progressive edge. Those involved in the project are aware of the weight of the original film, but they're also proud of adding new layers, like social commentary to its mythology. You get to tell stories about the people who you saw in the background of the original Grace. And it's really exciting to, to be able to give those characters a voice. And because we have 10 episodes, we have so much time to get deeper into those stories and to explore what it was like to be a teenager in the 50s, to be from a marginalized community in the 50s, to be, <laughs> to, to be seen finally. It's like finally our time and it's so exciting. And, but there's also a huge responsibility to fulfill this legacy and to be part of something that's so iconic. There are a lot of kids in Rydell who are sick of feeling like they're not welcome here. The issues tackled in the series, so often discussed today, were also present back in the 1950s. And the cast say that creates a shared consciousness between generations. We're gonna need some jackets. Watching the show and working on the show, I've learned that generations aren't that different, that, that young people of every generation were a little bit more in tune with the reality of the world than adults, and, and we're sort of shut down and told that our thoughts and opinions don't matter. But they do, and they're really important. It's very important to listen to children. So it's really special to me that our show centers, centers the thoughts and feelings of young people. To act cool, to look cool, and to be cool. For the makers of Rise of the Pink Ladies, it's important to start a conversation on social problems between different age groups. And with the show's legacy quality, which could bring together older fans of the film and newcomers, they may be able to pull that off. Actors Nicolas Cage and Nicholas Holt have teamed up once again. After playing a father-son duo in the dark comedy The Weather Man, they've now taken on a horror comedy as master and servant. Sorry to interrupt. Are you okay? I need to get out of a toxic relationship. Renfield is the long-suffering servant of Count Dracula. But when he falls in love, he decides to finally stand up to his creator, a narcissistic vampire, in hopes of finally breaking free of his servitude. You feel like he could destroy you with the snap of his fingers. The horror comedy film Renfield reunites Nicholas Holt and Nicholas Cage. Both actors say they're happy to be back together after so many years. No! No! Come call me the dark one. The difference is, in that movie I was starring, he was supporting, in this movie he's starring and I'm supporting. So it was interesting to watch him as the lead, because the lead actor always sets the pace. And I was trying to see what flavor is, is Nick Holt bringing so that I could find a, a way to support that. And what I found more often than not was he had this magnificent, natural, comedic timing and then he could go into very vulnerable moments. It's a completely new take on Renfield. I think that he's uh, reinvented the character. The duo is also glad about getting a chance to show their take on such iconic characters in a sequel to the 1930s original film. 
the interesting thing about this movie is obviously it's a, a, a vampire story on some elements. You have Dracula, but it's also more about this toxic relationship and this codependency between Dracula and Renfield and how they love each other but also just can't be around each other anymore and have to escape that. And with Dracula played by so many actors before, Cage says he tried to take inspiration from some of the best. Uh, there is the Lord of Death. It's been done very well, but the lion's share has been done not very well. Uh, so I looked at the times I thought it had been done well. Uh, Lugosi, uh, Langella, Christopher Lee, Oldman. And I thought, okay, that's a nice starting point. You sort of cherry pick that and then extrude out from there and try to find something that I can bring to. And that's just what I have internally that is, you know, I find, I tried to find the fusion of creepy and humorous in the same sentence. Redfield's boss. So much so that he stayed in character between scenes. Critics haven't reacted to the performances and film just yet, but viewers should take note that Renfield will creep into theatres on April 14th. I am Dracula. Okay, obviously we're dealing with a little bit more than just narcissism here. Cairo's so-called garbage city is a slum settlement that's home to garbage collectors and their families and also piles of trash. Now a volunteer there is teaching both women and children how to turn rubbish into fun. This is Zebulin, Cairo's district where garbage collectors live and recycle the materials they collect from all over the city. Tressa Said grew up here and she has come up with an idea to make life among trash easier for children. We want to connect the children with the environment they live in. This is a community where 85% of its members collect, sort and recycle garbage. Children see plastic, cardboard and paper. So why not use the material at hand to make a toy, musical instrument, a vase, or something reusable out of it? Said knows firsthand that life in the slums is not easy. And her center, Al-Masaha, meaning space in Arabic, is a place where she wants to show children that being angry about their environment is not a solution. Looking at the garbage as something they can upcycle, have fun with and learn from is a much better path. Today we let the children collect items from their homes and we also went to the street with them to collect items. We wanted them to see the items they collected on the table and see what can be done with them. Children started to participate. Some of them said they will make a piggy bank or drum. Others said they'll make home decorations. Al-Masaha is a non-profit organization and relies completely on volunteers. The space here is 100% dependent on the volunteers. The children themselves or their mothers help us sort and exhibit the items. We also have volunteers from outside the neighborhood who are interested in the idea and care about helping the community. Said hopes that one day she will get to help even more children all over Egypt think outside the box. With the armed conflict in the Democratic Republic of Congo's Goma province still ongoing, local artists are now using the streets as canvases with an aim to urge for peace and unity. A growing number of artists are using their work in defiance of the armed groups fighting for supremacy in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Theory Kroko is a Congolese painter who lives near the border with Rwanda. He says strangers have broken into his house and attacked him several times. Yet, he is among many who are trying to spread peace through art. He says his work is a call for unity regardless of ethnicity. The armed group M23 has been at war with us in the Congo for over 10 years. So we, as artists, wanted to send a message that our country needs peace. We don't want war every day. 
War is holding back development. Several young people have been victims of discrimination, accused of supporting armed groups like M23. Others are called Rwandans, Congolese, Tutsi, and we have found that this situation can lead us into civil war and violence. That is why we are trying to fight this through art. We do this on the walls of busy places to show the world what is happening. Artist Didier Kwande also belongs to a group of artists in Goma urging people to leave their differences behind. We have a problem here. We have found that people discriminate and others are violent. That's why we make these paintings, to call people to live together. Through these paintings, we also want to show people that violence and discrimination are not good. We want to show people the ideal and the importance of living together for the benefit of all. According to the U.S. think tank, the Council on Foreign Relations, civilians in the DRC have been subjected to human rights violations and extreme poverty for years. This month, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees reported that the conflict also affected the education of more than 600,000 children in the North Kivu region alone. And with millions of people internally displaced, Kroko, Kawende and other artists are trying to reveal their plight to the world with hopes their art will one day help stop this violence once and for all. The romantic comedy thriller has its roots in the works of Alfred Hitchcock. It may be a popular genre, but it's not an easy one to pull off. That's why it tends to disappear for a while. But this time, not only has it made a comeback, it's also given reason to suggest it might be here to stay. Bonjour. In Murder Mystery 2, Nick and Audrey now have their own detective agency and they get to work when one of their friends disappears. Do you remember what happened last time we were on a getaway? Yeah, some people died. Not so, a, lot, a lot of people. The first film was the most viewed production on Netflix in 2019. Part of that success came from the rom-com thriller appeal. It had the jokes, romance, and globetrotting adventure. But the performances of its stars also helped the movie receive acclaim. Jennifer Aniston and Adam Sandler now return to deliver more of that formula to expand murder mystery into a franchise. Reviews say in this case, their repetitive collaboration works. We have fun. I don't know why. It, it's, it's something you can't put your ever, it's, you know, lightning in a bottle. I don't know. We're just really lucky that we've had this in, insanely wonderful friendship for as long as we have, and, how, and we have as much fun working together. The real detectives have arrived. Wow. You must be the Spitzes. Yes. Yeah. Your reputation is prestigious. There you go. Not in a positive way, I'm afraid. Okay. Okay. Like the previous film, Murder Mystery 2, also has travelogue aspects. The main destination this time is Paris. And the locale adds both to the spectacle and the comedy. I don't want to kill anybody. Why not France? It felt very romantic and it's a beautiful, beautiful city to take Adam and I out of Brooklyn and put us in Paris. I mean, it's, you know, who doesn't love a good fish out of water story? Media outlets say the film's stars are arguably Netflix's biggest draw and that they want to build as many in-house franchises as possible with them. So it doesn't come as a surprise that a third movie has already been in the works since 2021. A museum in Vienna has finally responded to climate groups attacking famous paintings. And it's come up with a peaceful yet odd way to join the debate. Back in November, environmental activists from the group Last Generation did this. 
Yes, glass was protecting Gustav Klimt's death and life at the Leopold Museum in Vienna, but the attackers still made it to the headlines. The protest was their way of calling for an end to drilling for oil. We found this way to be absolutely the wrong one. We wanted to initiate something productive, something mediating that conveys a message. So instead of smearing the paintings, they decided to do this. And that's the story of the mini-exhibition called A Few Degrees More. It includes 15 works by artists including Klimt and Egon Schiele. Each tilted piece comes with a text and calls attention to how a global heating of more than 1.5 degrees Celsius would impact the landscapes they depict. Take Klimt's painting called On Lake Attersee. When Gustav Klimt painted this picture in 1900 in the midst of summer, the situation was quite different. An ideal world, a recreation area for people. But in the meantime, much has changed. The temperature of the water surface has risen by 2 degrees Celsius. This means that it has an impact not only on evaporation, but also that the water surface is retreating and the oxygen content is reduced which has a great impact on fauna and flora. One visitor admits he was confused about the whole thing before reading the texts. I first thought it was maybe an advertisement for the museum itself, but as <clears throat> I found myself reading, I thought uh, it was an important issue to discuss and I liked the approach to it. According to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, emissions must be halved by the mid-2030s. And this requires an enormous effort by governments, businesses and individuals. Meanwhile, activists are resuming their protests elsewhere. But the Leopold Museum hopes this exhibition sets an example in case they decide to target these priceless paintings once again. George Lucas made it known that he never intended to become a company CEO. All he ever wanted to do was to cruise the high streets of sunny California. Well, in a twist of irony, he did become the president of one of the most successful movie companies in Hollywood history. But as fate would have it, he also got to make a picture about his dream of endlessly cruising Modesto. And in our movie almanac, Alijan explains how American graffiti eventually became a social time capsule about life in the 1960s U.S. American graffiti! Where were you in 62? In the early 1970s, before the success of his space opera Star Wars, but after the failure of his allegorical sci-fi THX 1138, George Lucas decided to make a personal movie. What did you say? He said he wanted to document a time gone by and show the social norms and popular culture of small town life during the 1960s, with a small dose of political commentary thrown into the mix. She's gone. Get it. She spoke to me. She spoke to me right through the window. Inspired by Federico Fellini's I Vitelloni, he set American graffiti in his hometown and had different characters represent different stages from his life. What are you looking at? Who is that? Do you know him? He's following awful close. Grab onto something. <laughs> In the film, a group of high school graduates cruise the streets on the last day of summer before going into the adult world, with the Vietnam War's shadow cast over their future. There were other youth films that explored similar terrain, but what American Graffiti did was to remove 
exploitative elements like violence and turn it into a family movie going affair. With me. You take care of yourself, man. To achieve that, Lucas also curated a popular soundtrack featuring such artists like the Beach Boys and Buddy Holly. And made sure to include Americana landmarks like diners, which young people used for socializing back then. Lucas also wanted this love letter to be authentic. And to give his movie a documentary feel, he used technoscope cameras and allowed actors to improvise on set. In fact, your car's so neat, we're gonna give you our special prize. You want me to give it to you? Reviews say 1962, in which the movie is set, is an important year because it represents the nearing end of an era in American society. Music was about to change with the British invasion, led by the likes of the Beatles looming right around the corner. But critics say the movie also skillfully captures life before the Vietnam War changed the outlook of America's youth. They call the film a brilliant work of historical fiction that can't be matched by other sociological treatises. Do you go to JC? Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Do you know Guy Phillips? Yeah, sure. I got him in a class. Oh, he's so boss. How'd you like to ride around with me for a while? I'm sorry, I can't. I'm going steady. Library of Congress agreed and selected American graffiti for preservation for being culturally, historically, and aesthetically significant. Upon release, the movie's popularity revived interest for the 1960s and turned George Lucas into a millionaire. He reportedly set aside $300,000 from his earnings to independently produce his other passion project, Star Wars. And we all know how that turned out. Boy, are you conceited. I don't know why I ever asked you out in the first place. You didn't. I asked you out. What do you mean you asked me out? Backwards day, remember? If I had waited for you to ask me, oh, brother. Doha's Museum of Islamic Art has unveiled new galleries to celebrate the Qatar Indonesia Year of Culture. The permanent collection is also a revelation of Southeast Asia's hidden treasures. The Museum of Islamic Art has adorned the Qatari capital's waterfront since 2008. Despite being relatively new, the museum has just undergone a major renovation. And now it has new additions to its collection as part of the Middle Eastern nation's cultural partnership with Indonesia. The museum's deputy director says the new galleries make them stand out among their counterparts. We have dedicated two galleries for the arts of uh, Southeast uh, Asia. Uh, and it is to remind uh, the, the visitors that these are the homelands for the major uh, Muslim uh, communities uh, in the world. It's a subject that is usually underrepresented in other museums uh, in the world. Artifacts of Indonesian jewelry, a rare Quran manuscript, garments are among the items on display in the gallery. But there's also a big section dedicated to items discovered in the Java Sea. The new additions that we have is this showcase that uh, displays uh, the objects that were found uh, on the shipwreck. And it varies in different materials and its uh, region. And it expanded our understanding of the 
uh, of economic and cultural uh, exchanges. So, for example, we have uh, um, uh, rock crystal from uh, Madagascar, uh, glassware from uh, Iraq, um, uh, gold from Indonesia. But these are only a glimpse of what awaits in Qatar Indonesia Year of Culture. Enthusiasts are advised to stay tuned for more, as the program also includes photography, performing, as well as culinary arts. That's it for this episode of Showcase. I'm Esther Adrist from me and the whole team here in Istanbul. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.